Well, for more on this, with us is Stephen King, HSBC's Global Head of Economics and Asset Allocation Research. Stephen has also been a member of the ECB Shadow Council since 2007 and recently became a member of the Financial Times Economist Forum. Stephen, thank you so much for coming in. In terms of what we seem to see, there's always, every two days it seems, oh yes, actually a selective default is not so bad. Oh no, it's terrible. Are, are we shifting? Are, are more banks, you know, okay with the idea? And is this what we're going to get from Mr. Trichet today or no chance? I wouldn't say that any bank is particularly okay with the idea, but the reality is that there's a balance to be struck between the interests of the debtors in countries like Greece and the interests of the creditors elsewhere in Europe. And the whole debate really is about how you resolve those differences of interest between the creditors and debtors. Uh, whether you have sort of selective bailouts or selective defaults or whatever, the underlying political question is still there, which is what do you do about that relationship over the long term between the creditors and debtors? What the crisis has revealed is, is effectively a complete disagreement uh, but as yet, no political resolution. And I know you've been an advocate, of course, of fiscal unity, which, yeah. you know, how feasible is that? Well, I think it's not going to be feasible in the short term. What you need is some kind of timetable to get you closer to that kind of model in a few years' time. And the equivalent probably is what took place during the 1990s, during the ERM crisis, when the currency system seemed to be falling apart completely. It gave countries a choice. Um, either they went for a single currency, which many countries chose to do eventually, or they went their own separate ways, which is what the UK did. Uh, but in expressing that choice, there was a democratic process uh, towards a timetable to create the single currency. I think you need something else similar to that over the course of the next few years, a choice about whether you want to have a stronger, closer fiscal union or whether countries should go their own separate ways. It should be clear to countries what the cost would be of going their own separate ways, you know, huge cost in terms of funding their government deficits, uh, difficulties of accessing ECB, ECB yeah. credit, etc. All those things will be important and put into the mix. Um, so you know, in terms of what we're expecting, you know, the selective default, how quick is it going to arrive? And it will, of course, be orchestrated so that Greece doesn't get shut out of the money markets for those couple of weeks where it will essentially be shut out, I guess. Well, in effect, Greece is shut out already because much of what uh, Greece is raising on the markets effectively is coming from transfers from other uh, European countries. The continuous process of making promises about future austerity, then discovering that the austerity wasn't delivered to the extent that people had expected or the economy has not recovered, means further blank checks to be written in the future. And the problem currently is that the way Europe is heading is towards a kind of fiscal transfer union yeah. where the Germans pay taxes to fund the Greeks um, and you end up effectively with um, a breakdown of the relationship between taxpayers and the ultimate recipients of those uh, taxes. And of course there's one thing that the crisis has taught us is that it seems the European governments are consistently behind the curve in actually dealing with the crisis. Is there a window of opportunity narrowing? Well, I think the situation that's coming through now is so critical that this pushes towards some kind of political solution eventually. Mm -hmm. One might have said back in 92, 93 that the European governments and central banks were behind the curve when it came to the ERM crisis. They absolutely were. But the crisis itself was the thing that forced change. And in the current circumstance, I think there has to be, again, change coming through, which is associated with the responsibilities of the creditors and debtors uh, in different parts of Europe. We haven't quite got there yet. In one sense, that means the crisis has to get worse before people realize what the key choice is actually going to be. Uh, we're also, of course, expecting the ECB president today to hike interest rates. How much damage will he cause the periphery countries? Well, already, of course, they're paying a fortune to fund um, their deficits, so the answer is probably not that much. Um, the key question really is, to what extent will the increase in interest rates, the tightening of policy because of inflation, damage broader growth prospects across the Eurozone, and to what extent is there room for you know, countries like Greece and Ireland and Portugal and Spain to actually see their economies recovering? The problem, of course, over the last year or so has been even when austerity has been delivered, the growth numbers have ended up a lot worse than people had expected, particularly for some countries like, say, Greece. Uh, and the consequence is they've taken one step forward and two steps back. Uh, certainly raising interest rates doesn't help that much, but you know, let's be real, the chances of rates going up a long way are actually quite uh, slim at this stage. Uh, Stephen, in 15 seconds, do you think that Mr. Trichet will talk about collateral or is he just going to stay on the fence another time? I, I think we'll have to wait and see. I think it's difficult at this stage to say. Uh, I guess nothing new except a lot of investors are hoping that the emerging markets will continue to be the great saviour in times of crisis, not only here in Europe but in the US. And it all depends on what the governments are doing to manage their own problems. Absolutely. The growth numbers we've seen from the emerging world over the last two or three years have been phenomenally strong given the weakness of the states and given the weaknesses coming through in Europe. 
Uh, of course, it's been so strong that inflation has become the number one concern in many parts of the emerging world over the last few months. And the good news that comes from our report is the fact that although growth itself is slowing, which is not such encouraging news, uh, there is plenty of evidence that inflationary pressures have faded relative to where they were at the end of last year. Now, why are they fading? Well, interest rates across the emerging world are still mostly pretty low. Uh, what seems to be happening is that the so-called quantitative tightening measures uh, this is increases in reserve ratios in China and that kind of thing, seem to be having an effect in drying up credit. And the drying up of credit seems to be perhaps beginning to push inflationary pressures down. So hopefully later this year we'll find inflationary pressures fading. That might mean lower commodity prices globally. And of course that also then begins to feed through into a slightly better environment for other parts of the world as well. So I think the key thing from the report is the fact that inflationary pressures which have been elevated are showing some signs of fading. Uh, Stephen, in terms of how much also, you know, a lot of these countries do trade amongst each other, but I guess they're also hurt by, you know, capital controls and tariffs. How much is that hurting inter-country trade? Well, when we look at trade around the world, it's absolutely dominated still by the states and Europe. And, of course, China trades very heavily with the states and, say, Russia trades very heavily with Germany. What we haven't seen so much of is the growth of what we call South-South trade, which is Asia through to the Middle East, through to Sub-Saharan Africa, through to Latin America. Now, it's absolutely right that the, the borders, the economic borders that prevent trade from taking place are very high, tariffs, capital controls, and so on. That's all beginning to change, though. And I think if you think about the longer-term prospects for the global economy, as those borders come down, we're going to end up with a revolution in global trade dominated by the southern nations and effectively opening up a new... Uh, significant expansion of global activity in the years ahead. So actually how much bigger would their growth be without these barriers? Oh, a long, long way. So we estimate that, for example, trade across the southern nations could expand tenfold over the next 20 or 30 years. So there's a phenomenal opportunity there to actually see an expansion of trade. The only question is, are the incentives there to deliver that? And one key incentive is that China, for example, has to invest not just infrastructure in China, but also in Latin America and sub-Saharan Africa to make sure it can extract the commodities it needs with relative ease in the future. Stephen, so we're almost out of time, but we have 30 seconds left. What do you make of Chinese interest rates? They went up, or is that it? for 2011? Well, it'd be nice to think so. We've had lots of uncertainties over the course of the last few months about how much further rates will have to rise. But the key thing to concentrate here on China is not so much the rate increases themselves, but also the possibility of further increases in reserve ratios. Yeah. Uh, and in particular, watch the credit numbers over the next few months. All right, Stephen King, thank you so much for coming in the studio today.